today, but because uh, as we say in Italy, we should not put too much wood in the fire. <laughs> so there is uh, enough stuff for the moment to discuss. It just uh, uh, reminded these two hypotheses, uh, which are distinguished but uh, connected in some way. Uh, the first one, the hypothesis of the archaeological historical machine, and the other, the hypothesis of the two ontologies, ontologies of the commandment of, of the esto and of the being of the indicative mood. As you see, both are double. In both cases, we have to face a double machine. In the first case, grounded on the, uh, the, 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 couple, the conceptual couple uh, origin and commandment, and the second case also a double model. Uh, what, what, I have to, what I want to like to suggest is that these machines work precisely through their double structure. So, we have two elements, two poles, which are distinguished but related, put in connection. And they can function only through their opposition and connection. First thing, also I, I said that in this uh, double paradigm, we inscribe the religion law magic on one side, science and philosophy on the other, and we said <coughs> that perhaps technology could be between the two, and the techne, of course, is the Greek name for art. Where would you place art? You suggested the idea of aesthetics today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, apparently, art, uh, you, you perhaps remember that uh, in the poetic Aristotle distinguished poetry from history because uh, history refers to reality and uh, poetry to possibility, something which can be. So, it could be. But probably, also we have a kind of crossing point. Perhaps we can uh, we could describe uh, like technology art here on the line of division. Because uh, you're right, uh, it is not the form of science, something is and that, but uh, also it's not uh, the system expressed in form. Uh, Art is not, is not the form of an imperative necessity. Yeah, the, the most ancient poem, uh, the Iliad, begins with an imperative, so sing, uh, goddess. But nevertheless, uh, for instance, a, a novel has not the form of an imperative. But probably we could uh, place art as a third. What's your opinion on that? Thinking of Adorno and aesthetics and the subjective and objective in art, and I could see the subjective being esto and the objective being sd, and more on a spectrum. More? More on a spectrum between the two than having to place art in one or the other. And I'm not saying it's to get out of the commitment of one or the other, but I just, I don't see art um, as, as singular enough to place in either category. Yeah, but probably it is an acrostic part. Yeah. Is a tertium quid as an escape here. Yeah, right. So, I mean, and I'm thinking of Adorno and Aesthetics where he talks about the art of the subject and the art of the object. <coughs> rather different forms of art. Mm -hmm. That's my <coughs> I don't know if it necessarily has to stay on the border. You can maybe put a circle around the border that's always kind of going in between 
is the poetic element, poetic moment in philosophy, because it is the moment in which the philosopher gives the meaning. No? So it names the idea, for instance, when a uh, philosopher invent a term, names an idea. In, in that sense, uh, giving name has always been uh, uh, seen as being near to poetry nation and poetry often go together, you know? as if uh, poetry could be a language made only by proper names. Mm -hmm. The poet names. In that case, also nomination could also not, it's not possible to place it in one or the other. Also, as nomination is a crossing point. Well, more generally, I also would say when we talked earlier about signification, you know, maybe not even in names, but in images or other phenomena we can experience or come to some understanding through different kinds of signification. So <coughs> signification also rides somewhere between these things in an interesting way. Because it can have names or text to it, or it could have numbers, or it could have Signification that have many different kinds of symbols to communicate that process. Or something. And I think we could follow them to my head. object is uh, on the side of the SD, science, knowledge, <coughs> then it's an activity uh, which is uh, grows of the other. So, and it's also, also. says that divination is not a um, is not a an opposing knowledge or I think the exact wording from on the order of things that it's not a rival form of knowledge but that it's rather a part of the main body of knowledge itself um, and in a formation like divination an activity like divination this seems to be kind of precisely the interstitial See, apparently it should be on the side of the religion, faith, magic. And also, when you are when you are speaking, in a way we could say that what Foucault does is to analyze the savoir, knowledge, etc., etc., but on the point of view of a commandment. Mm. No? In the last instance, what he does is to show how knowledge can embody a commandment. It's, a, it's analysis of the, the, the savoir as a practice also. So in some way, so it's true that um, knowledge can always embody a part of commandment. And this is precisely the subject of Foucault investigations. But this means that they cross, this means that they Apparently are divided, but then on the contrary, that they function often together. One grafts, grafts of the other, mm -hmm. grafts of the other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in that way, our culture 
really works. So we, we never have pure science. We never, almost never have pure commandment. We have, we have always a mixture, a crossing of the two. This is an important point because I really think that uh, this is the object of Foucault investigations. How to, he, he never formulates uh, this opposition, of course, but uh, when he approaches uh, knowledge, he, he approaches it in the perspective of the commandment that knowledge can em embody in itself. <coughs> and this is important not to forget this uh, connection. Between, uh, so when you spoke of education, of course, yeah. Transmission of knowledge goes with the commandment. I I uh, I'm thinking of a of a stupid scenario that I I'm not I'm not sure whether it's useful for this discussion or not, but I'm just going to tell anyway. Uh, uh, I think of you know kids always and um, very often create games for themselves, and uh, you know a group of kids and they get together and then they try to use the objects and play around, but then they. Um, very often they develop a set of rules for themselves in order to play with this object like um, for instance a, a water gun or, or so etc. And um, during the process they uh, often create rules that bind people in, in, um, in order to be fair. In order to? Uh, rules to be, in order to, for the game to be fair. Because you know, uh, like uh, if, a, if a kid is stronger, then maybe they invent some rules to you know, restrict the advantage from, from that kid. And the, and then the, the, the rules get developed, and, and, and actually for me, the rule is the game itself because if you start this rule, you get no games at all. But then um, there's an interesting phenomenon that I often observe from, from my students. I, I'm a teacher, by, by the way. And um, if the rules get too strict, then there's no fun at all because um, only the one who fits in the rule will, will win the game and has all the chance to win the game. But then if the rule is too loose, that means uh, you can do whatever you want. Then you, um, you know, everybody just get losing around, and, and the game actually breaks apart. And uh, I, I don't know how um, this scenario may fit into the, the framework, but uh, what I get is, it seems that the the the, um, the degree of how people obey the rules has this linkage to how pe how people are actually enjoying the rule itself, because um, um, if, if the rule um, because. Um, but when you are within the game, you are rationalizing all this rule of the game. You are using using the rational reasoning in terms of you know how 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 things are sort, sort out through, through the rules. But then outside this field, outside this sphere, you actually there's this being there to decide whether you enjoy the game or not, or you just fit or you are outside of the rule. Okay, so maybe uh, I don't know how you respond to this. Absolutely. Uh, we said uh, before that uh, Foucault investigation could be defined uh, as we saw. Now, starting from your observation, you could say that Wittgenstein investigation on the game, in the philosophical investigation, what he calls uh, language games. No, it's like that, to see how the rule that seem to govern our grammar, our language, embody a pragmatic, embody a, a commandment, embody something which is in a different order. And, and it is this that precisely according to Wittgenstein explains the function of the of language. <coughs> and, and not, uh, so it's kind of, you are, we are developing a kind of Wittgensteinian uh, model of uh, children playing. <coughs> Curious then about how this model of the child at play, or considering the Anjou, what does that play in the situation? Could um, how this interfaces with your formulation of the child at play as the site of profanation, um, and perhaps that's a topic that we could develop in this um, the inquiry into this border space between these these knowledges, these logos. Um, because if I'm not mistaken, the, the image of the children at play is also the site of potentiality from which uh, the process of 
returning to the common use. This is one yeah, of the main sites. Disactivating uh, something which has been separated uh, in a certain mm -hmm. sphere in order to open up to a new usage, to new possible usage. And to place like that, because they take uh, <coughs> something which uh, refers to war, mm -hmm. weapons, etc., and they disactivate, uh, but uh, staying, I mean, like staying in the same, apparently in the same model, they make another usage of it. Another point that I want to comment Right, it's a point to follow on, and as I said, Montaigne says uh, there is a name and a thing. The name is a sound which designates and signifies the thing. The name is not a part of substance. It is a piece attached to the thing that is foreign to and outside of it. It's from Montaigne's essay on the cannibals. And I think that that, that, that foreignness, that, that uh, always possible recourse to the exterior is that thing which opens that sight uh, a bit, that keeps it open a bit, and allows it to be uh, disactivated <coughs> and uh, uh, put to the surface of other and new possibilities. So that, that there's always uh, an element of, of foreignness between the attachment to the name and the substance not a part, but it's nonetheless linked. You mentioned numbers before, and I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of numbers because they seem so simple, the way that you're talking about all numbers, one, two, three, but <coughs> like those would seem to be on the SP side, but it already implies a whole world of, if there could be one person and there's another person, that you could separate those and define where they begin. <coughs> numbers. Yeah, as I was taught numbers as a child, I wasn't taught numbers as a theoretical and thing which doesn't exist. Like so you said number? Yeah, like in numbers, um, they Im it seems like they already imply a, the possibility to separate them. So to say here's one thing and then here's another thing. So even though they seem like they're on one side, they imply this whole world of what reality is. Like that I could say there's one person, I could say, yeah, parents begins here and ends here. There is a peculiar usage of number that I is the numbering. Mm -hmm. the, the numbers can be used to number things. Yes. One, two, three, four. This is uh, only one usage of number. Mm -hmm. then right, the right. problem is uh, really to ask but which is the relationship between the number and the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not simply the fact of the number. Why, what, does it do, what do we mean when we say that this thing is one? Right. This is really a big problem that we have to enter. <laughs> no, and, but another connected question. I, why did I use the term ontology in both cases? Because probably if Aristotle would be here, he would have said, no, you're wrong. The non apophantic clause does not refer to me. Uh, it's not true, it's indifferent to truth and falseness, etc. But I think, no, that, that uh, there is a real relationship between the commandment, prayer, etc., and being. But it is not the same way in which the ST refers to things, it's a different way. Uh, what, what I mean? Uh, you perhaps know that the, one of the most ancient texts in the tradition, in the tradition of Western philosophy, it is the Parmenides poem. And uh, this uh, Parmenides poem contains a famous uh, statement, esti gar ene, there is indeed being. Being is indeed. Esti gar ene, a literal. There is indeed being. Now, if we take the other model of the esto, then this would be should be uh, reformulated in the form esto gar en. Let's being be. I don't know how to translate it in English. No, it's an imperative. Being must be. Let's be. Let's be. be. Let's be. 
let's be in B. So the imperative refers in some way to a B, but not in the usual form we are accustomed to or something is like that, etc. It's uh, what uh, in German is expressed by the position Sein soll, being and having to be, or ought in English. In English it's very difficult to, to state sollen in English, ought perhaps. Being and ought, having to be, I ought to. Uh, so so it's, a, it's an exigency that be, uh, could be paradoxically formulated and form said, Let, let's be be. <laughs> Being has to be. Very, and, uh, and this <coughs> is the origin of the, this very bad idea so important in modern time, the idea of duty, that was completely ignored by Greeks, for instance. The duty, we couldn't uh, say what it is a duty. But on the contrary, we are accustomed to, the, accustomed to this idea of uh, something has to be, must be. All uh, modern ethics is grounded on this idea of duty at least starting from Kant. And this means that we do not have, a mo modern ethics does not exist. Because an ethic grounded on duty is simply nonsense. Simply. One of the most uh, vicious things I can imagine. But, but on the contrary, we are accustomed to think uh, in this, in this, uh, this, in this perspective. But that's why I say I use the, uh, the, I use the term ontology, even for the Esther. It is a strange reference to being, but in this strange uh, form of a note, a to be. And one who reflected uh, a lot on this problem of the difference between Sein and Zoll and being and ought is uh, the great Austrian jurist Kelsen. Kelsen, who developed uh, this uh, pure theory of uh, law of right. So there, I just quote a passage from him because uh, he has the ability of really stating very clearly what uh, is at stake when we express a commandment. When a man utters the will that another man behave in a certain way, the sense of this act cannot be described saying that the other man will behave in that way, but only saying that he ought to behave in that way. Zolven, I think it was the term <coughs> So, you so see the, the commandment. Uh, we must not mistake a commandment as if uh, the, 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 the correct description would be the commandment has to do that someone will do something. No, someone has to do. So, and being a design and zone connected and, and distinguished. <coughs> and uh, he put this distinction at the very foundation of law. So the, the law, the norm, is the realm of the soul, the old. <coughs> which is, which is uh, just an, an, another uh, reaffirmation of what we saw, that the law is the part of the ontology of the S. But then, when we see it like that, oh, it's honor, what does this mean? <coughs> to try to ask the question, okay, so when uh, you receive a commandment, you will not do this, but you have to, you ought to. But what does it mean? This, this is the emptiness of the concept of duty, of your duty. What does it mean that I have to? I have the duty to? 
that just means I received the commandment. Just another way to restate uh, the, the very simple fact that someone commanded some, to, something to someone. Now, the idea that the commanded one has the, the duty, has to do. So it's a, it's on the, from one point it's clear that it's, it will not, so it's not an effect. So the content of the commandment is not a certain behavior, the execution. No? We saw this would be false. But if now we restate, say, okay, it's not a certain behavior, it is the duty to, it is the, the obligation to behave in a certain way. What does it mean? What does this mean? Again, only that we receive the commandment. What do you think? Well, when it comes to the law, there is a whole prescription of if you do not, uh, you shall not kill, but if you do kill, and then there is a list of what... Uh, the sanction. Yes, but uh, so, he always... Uh, this pure theory of the law, because... <coughs> Yes, it's really very subtle. In some way, we we'll say, the sanction does not refer to the man who acts. It is just another norm addressed to the one who has the duty to apply the sanction. So, for instance, in Kelsen perspective, this is very a very nice thing. For instance, the you see, the street code, the code uh, of, the, uh, of the car circulation, does not address to the driver, addresses to the policeman, to the street police. And then after this is police, address to the judge. And after to the judge, address to the director of the prison. They have to do so, so okay. it's a kind of a norm that will uh, refer to another norm and then to another norm to another norm to another norm so the so the, the, the reality of what you said that the force the violence will oblige you it's a exterior to the system below it's an interesting point on this idea that, <laughs> that the, the, the law does not address to the people to the citizen but only to the policeman mm -hmm. does that also apply to logos itself pardon how does that apply to logos as well? That sort of ought to. Like if I say something, somebody then ought to respond, and there's a certain limitation on how they can respond. Yeah. The interesting point would be that, um, for instance, if you refer this uh, ontology command only to language, you could say, uh, so in the ontology of the ST, the word refers to a reality. In this other ontology, a word has to refer. There is a kind of, uh, the commandment uh, refers to the very relation between word and thing. So in the other model, there is a relation between word and thing. In this uh, model, model of the commandment, there is no relation a word or thing, there, but it, there must be. It's a commandment to the word in order to enter in relation, to refer to things. No, one, one could say like that. Like that. It would be a very interesting idea. That, uh, so, so the, and this is not very strange because this, uh, if we go back to the idea that the commandment, the imperative, is the primitive form of the verb, so in a way the primitive form of language, in the beginning, <coughs> when man became a speaking being, let's imagine the situation. Suddenly, man begins to speak. What can he say in the very moment? There is, a, there is still no relation between the word and things. So that's why perhaps it is the original form of language. It is a commandment that man gives in some way to his language that it should refer to things and also for instance that I will keep my word. 
I will. Uh, th that's the very the, it's important. We, we, it's the problem of the commandment is near to the problem of oath. Oath, uh, oath is perhaps the oldest human institution. Uh, Aristotle says like that. Uh, Aristotle says uh, oath is the oldest god, most ancient god. God. And even the other god are submitted uh, to, to oath. But what does happen in oath? In oath, a man commands himself to keep his word, to respond to his word. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's like the foundation of the relation between word and reality. My word will refer to reality. <coughs> so we could even say that uh, we, we saw that the imperative cannot be in the first person. So, uh, oath is uh, an imperative in the first person. It's a commandment in the first person. And a commandment is a note to the second person. While you can, you know that you can only swear for yourself. You can't just swear for another. Of course, you can only swear for yourself. But the commandment could be, in that perspective, a note for another. Swearing for another. It's, it's interesting that you put it this experiment trying to imagine what would be the first thing to speak and talking about oaths I'm thinking here about Heraclitus he says that um, people that don't understand the logos they're, you know, they have, they're, they're barbaric you know, they're barbaroi but I've I read an interesting uh, someone in the literature says you know what Heraclitus was referring to was uh, the Magoi, the Persians that had to sit in the temples and watch the Greeks pray. I don't know why, but I guess this was uh, the law of the, of the Persians, was that the Persians had to have people watching the Greeks pray. And, but from this, Heraclitus develops his theory of, of psyche and logos, uh, and then subsequently Plato and Aristotle developed their own thing. And we end up in this bizarre situation now. I mean, when I make this uh, uh, kind of uh, experiment uh, of imagination, ima let's imagine uh, the event, uh, the original event of language. Of course, uh, this is not uh, an historical inquiry, it's an experiment, uh, a thought, uh, thought experiment, a mind experiment. <coughs> but, but nevertheless, it's true that. Uh, uh, also, already the Greek uh, and the Rachelus was one of the first, and then the others to distinguish in the la in language two levels: mm -hmm. the level of names and the level of uh, discourse. We can, and Vitica uh, makes the same. So we can have a, have a discourse. We can speak only if we presuppose that names are there. In order to speak, names must, must be there, words must be there. But this seems evident, but it's not at all evident if you think about it. Who said that first we had the nomination and terms and after uh, the discourse? But, but then uh, in our experiment we are brought to think that it is like that. Uh, if we imagine how we could... <coughs> language happen, perhaps in the form of uh, names, just as used names. Uh, Augustine the, the, says this, Vitzel uh, says this. But it's strange that so we imagine language again as a double machine grounded on two levels and only the distinction and the relation of these two levels allows language to work. So we have to imagine that first we have names, then we have discourse, combination of names, and in this way language works. Um, getting back to oath, which I found. Pardon? Getting back to oath, mm -hmm. the act of oath. 
it's very interesting. I'm sure you're building up to this, but of course you said when you take an oath, you say I swear to you, and of course in um, Latin languages we say je jure in French, or so jure jure. This is the this is the foundation of law. So when you bind yourself to someone else, this is a kind of enactment of the law, which I I never thought of before in that way. Which you know, in some ways you think about protection of property or um, perhaps expressions of freedom, but in this case of the oath, you actually bind yourself to someone else. There's a commitment, and in that enactment, there is a kind of notion of law, because you swear, and it's directly connected back to this idea. Absolutely. So, oath, uh, as historians uh, just uh, think knows, uh, is a very old institution, perhaps one of the eldest institutions. And again, you cannot say if it is juridical or religious. It's impossible. Since the beginning, it's both, because it's an act of law, that's sure. But gods are involved as witness, curses there as a, as a threat. So it's both religious and uh, because it's like that in the beginning, you cannot distinguish law and religion. And both, it perhaps really the, the very place on, on this uh, original status. It's very interesting. Here. So it has religious connotations, but also public, because you say that you you swear to someone in the face of God or others. So there's a kind of very public disclosure as well. So that's another aspect of it. I'm just trying to understand in that original sense what this form meant. So it meant it had a connection to the divine, it had a connection to the public, but it was saying it had a connection to binding to another person, other other aspects. Because I don't really understand, I'm trying to understand the... You can't really understand what? I don't understand the whole context of this original concept of the oath. So it has religious, public, juridical, or legal kind of um, aspects, but are there other aspects that maybe we should... So, so, if you go back, the ancient, most ancient document, the Bible was created in India, the India is full of heroes taking oaths. And it's both juridical, because they are in to do something. And uh, uh, religious because always God is uh, invoked as a witness. Uh, but then. Uh, it's the authorization of the oath, maybe, in a way. Yeah, it seems uh, that is also a strange thing because uh, that's why I say perhaps in the oath what is at stake really is really the. Link the relation between the world <coughs> and reality. And men's, men are here swearing that they will keep that word. Because then, uh, in the, uh, in, in the, when we go back, for instance, in Egypt, you have heroes taking votes. But then you have already absolutely clear the fact that men <coughs> are perjured. How do you say it? So, because uh, um, usually pe people say that uh, now today, of course, uh, people uh, make perjury, so we do not really believe in the sacredness of the oath. But probably in the origin, when people took an oath, there was so strongly the presence of the sacred that they. Not true at all. When you see the document, for them, it was clear that since the origin, people could uh, make perjury. Even Plato says, uh, because you know that in the uh, Greek and uh, Roman trial, had the form of a note. So the, the trial began as uh, two persons giving a note, and then the judge then began to see which one was the true one. And, and there is a passage of Plato who says, this is not good. Because if uh, this is really done, then you will necessarily discover that half of the population of Athens are liars. <laughs> <laughs> so for them it was clear that... Uh, uh, so I don't, uh, don't really uh, believe to this idea of the, uh, the religious or sacred aspect of the thing. Po probably in the beginning it was uh, just... Uh, the engagement to keep the world, knowing that it was open to perjury.
I was going to say, in some sense, it's become... But, but it tend uh, to, again, to go back to our idea, that it tend the form of a commandment giving to, to yeah. himself. I was going to say, in the, in the manners that it's used now, it's become a kind of parody of itself. Uh, a politician gets uh, called on by the president or the prime minister to be a cabinet minister, and they do this oath. Everyone who works for them as political advisors have to do an oath, senior level, public servants do the same thing, but it's a formality that you go through yeah, that's it, kind of it, public. It's a formality, but no, so that's strange. So oath, which is a very ancient thing, is still there. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our societies, especially American uh, one, the, the American society, they take oath everywhere, every moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but the, 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 the part where it does actually, in kind of a sense of legality, um, still have relevance is that uh, the basis of breach of trust in the legal order uh, is connected with that oath uh, that's given as a politician or someone working in the public interest. Yeah, because probably, probably oath is the paradigm of this uh, ontology, so it is the paradigm of law. So it's of obviously it's still there, because uh, law still functions on, on that way, kind of performance, so I, I swear. Mm -hmm. so the law is the always a kind of a performance. I say something and this obliges me. No, not only in the in the in the oath, also the form of the contract. Or uh, in marriage, I say something and this makes the thing. This obliges me. And oath is a kind of paradigm of all this. But it is evidently on the side of the commandment. I was saying, you're also given the choice of uh, which book you put your hand on, which religious orientation, and there's also a secular option now. <laughs> which one? Do you know which is the secular option? Uh, usually you sign uh, saying, no. you know, I, I uphold the values of this, or I'll stay loyal to the country or the region sure. of the government, and then you sign yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Put your hand on your own signature? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if, um, so we're talking about oath and why uh, would why would this be uh, a religious and yet also legal uh, thing? And I think I, I keep thinking with Heraclitus here that uh, he really disliked Homer. This was his enemy. You know, he said Homer he doesn't know what the words mean. You know, and he would think of him as like a just anthropoid. You know, like just base person, because like you said, there's two dimensions of knowing. But one thing that it seems that Heraclitus disliked about Homer was that in the Iliad or you know, in these kind of stories, the gods made people win. And so people had no uh, responsibility. And Heraclitus you know, puts forward the, his ideas so that people become the central factor. But I wonder... Also, if this is something about the written word versus just speaking, you know, suddenly I can I can have this pharmacon or whatever that Socrates didn't like it either. Uh, do you, do you think that there's something about writing itself that kind of starts the engine of, of these two sides? <coughs> writing is, is always relevant. All the time. But, I don't know, because, for instance, uh, uh, oath, which is very ancient, obviously began in an oral society. So it was just uh, uttered. And th then, of course, we have written, uh, also in Greece, we have written oaths. Uh, often, law was followed by an oath, and this is written. But originally, uh, we, we must think to an oral society, the efficacy of this uh, of oath, etc., refer just to the uttered word, the fact of uttering a word. This had uh, what had to be this uh, effect, this efficacy. That is, uh, I, I will be true to my word. But it's still uh, very important, and it's, it's not true that uh, it disappeared.
because it, but it cannot disappear because it is part of this uh, model. I just have one more thought on the kind of the embarkation in, of this analogy <coughs> that we're using between the juridical sphere and the religious sphere, um, and kind of uh, thinking on Paul's lines etymologically. I mean, this is in the term as we use it, religion. Uh, you know, this derives from the ligare, from the ligature, uh, that is the binding principle that is enacted. By the way, it's a, fa it's a false etymology. A false etymology? Yeah, according to philologists, the, the, the religion does not come from religare, but from re legere, to read again. <laughs> because the religious man is scrupulous. The religious man reads twice, thinks, is a screw. So it's the idea of uh, re uh, to reread, to read again, to pay attention to the form. And this goes also to the juridical uh, <coughs> functioning. In law, uh, when you go back to, uh, to, for instance, to Roman law, the essential thing of law of use, this is the relation between use et jus jurando, eh? the, the, the Latin name for uh, oath is linked to use to law. Uh, because this was, uh, the implication here was that the formula you are implied is decisive. You have to state correctly the formula. And if you do this, you say the law. And the and law will act. That's why it's a religion. Being scrupulous, pay attention to <coughs> the forms, the formulas, to pronounce the correct form. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and for instance, the, the, the udex, the judge, <coughs> etymologically, is the one who use digit, tells the use. But in that meaning, he knows the right form, he knows the correct form. <coughs> And uh, this is also more interesting for the religion. Uh, the religion is not uh, the idea of a link between uh, God and man. It is the idea of uh, paying attention to this relation, to this, uh, the, which is also difference. Hmm? Is the open form of bondage though? I guess that's what I was trying to ask. Is it a form? You are willingly devoting yourself or promising yourself to someone else, but it is a kind of act of, and I feel like a reduction of your freedom in relationship to that other person. That's kind of what I was curious about to say that, oh, this act has a relationship to a whole system, which is law, but it in, in, a, in effect, it means to willingly give up your freedom to be bound. You bind yourself to, to the world you have. Do you like rules? Yes. Yeah. Who said yeah? Well, I said that. You, you do like rules. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know the strange thing, so if, if you are familiar with the gospel, you will perhaps remember that uh, Jesus extremely clearly forbids swearing. <laughs> you must never take a no. <laughs> no doubt, it's, it's like that. So you can, and the church, on the contrary, re-establish oh, as an <laughs> important practice. That's, that shows how <laughs> oath is a uh, something that cannot be renounced by these institutions, religion, etc. And Jesus forbids oaths. But why do you like oaths? <laughs> because it's heretical. Because it's heretical. <laughs> 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 no, I understand. As I said, the interest of oath is probably 
it was the, the way which men obliged to obey something. Mm -hmm. So they promised that uh, it is like that, I will uh, follow, I will act as I said. And this is a radical way. <coughs> but why do you need an oath to do this? Mm -hmm. Did you say it was a debt? Huh? Did you say it was a debt? No, a debt. Um, you know, like when you owe someone money, a debt. A debt. So that the law is a kind of receipt for this debt that you have to pay in a way, in the sense. I mean, it seems like. But it's, that, as you said, a man himself obliged. So it's not oath. It's not uh, obliged. You know? yeah, it can be sometimes, but in your origin, it's a believer and the leader. I, it's well, completely free. But then, why do you need an oath in order to keep your word? Maybe it's when I when I got married, with my wife, we had the sim a similar kind of discussion because we could just go to the, the justice of the peace and the three this judge and the two of us and we would be married. But then there was something really um, there was this possibility in bringing together our friends our families to have this interaction and then to speak with them and, and in giving I, I don't know that we use the word oath but in speaking with the assembled people suddenly uh, our relationship was very different from previously we were together for maybe two years or something but now we were in a sense kind of bringing together something much bigger than previously what we had. And so making this, I don't know if both, but this kind of a pledge. Yeah, but that's, this also reminds me, uh, the philosopher who followed Plato in uh, the academic school, the school of Plato, says things that I like, always liked very much. Law wants that we make for duty what we want to make for love. <laughs> why, why, they, why they want to oblige you to make what we like to do? And, and this is the idea of uh, Jesus. You know, Jesus. Uh, that was the idea. Why to oblige you? Must you have to make it, but, but for love. And also in your your uh, paradigm, yeah, we stay together because we love each other, not because we promise to stay together. But nevertheless, I am not minimizing the oath. No, I think Aristotle is right when he says it is the oldest God. Mm -hmm. yes. what, what I kind of, of, of feel with this oath is that we need to have it in order to cope with our finitude, to, to think, to make us believe that we have a future. Because the art is always in the future, not in the right now. But if we have to, then we are immediately thinking that there is a future, that there is something in front of us. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, that this we didn't say, but also grammar, etc. say commandment always refers to future. Because, of course, if you command something, nothing is there. No? But the implication is that it will be there. But perhaps uh, if Kelsen is right, it's not really true, because that when you uh, command something, this does not mean that something will happen. Something ought, ought to happen, which is a, a slightly different thing. So, so something that I, I like about the oath, and I, I suppose it's connected to the ancient tradition, is uh, in contemporary life, the uh, written contract generally has to do with a financial transaction of some kind. And in uh, where I'm from, in Vancouver, uh, there's uh, old, city. Yeah, old institutions uh, like the Vancouver and District Labor Council. They've been around for 100 years. And before you come as a guest to speak there, you have to uh, give an oath that you'll uh, support the labor movement and all these guys. It's something from a different era but they've been doing it for whatever, 100 years. But there's something kind of quaint and traditional and something about giving your word 
as a person and not meaning something that's been eroded over time. Yeah. Uh, there's a beautiful book by an historian called Paolo Prodi. Uh, it, it is the history of oath as a, f a foundation of Western politics. So we, our society, the political of our society, this is uh, the thesis of this historian, I think is right, cannot be understood without the oath. Always oath well, uh, took a, had a huge role in politics. <coughs> of course, in the ancient time, uh, it's, very, it's clear. Now it seems less important, but it still is there, as you showed. And, uh, and then he also, if it's true, if the, uh, the question he asked at the, the end of this book is, uh, if we really believe that now oath is declining, that we do not really believe in this uh, form, and then we should imagine a completely new society because our society was grounded on both in some way, our political society. And, uh, yes. you, don't, you don't think that community is also based upon the oath? Yeah. Well, we, I mean, outside of politics. Historically, uh, often groups, communities, they are founded as a no. Also, also conspirations. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called conj conjure. How do you say conspiracy? Con 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 <coughs> conjuration. Why? Because people swear. Congregation. They are going to kill uh, the, the king. Yeah. So that's, that's a, so it's political groups were always grounded on votes. <coughs> I mean, also it seems that it has to do. It, it doesn't have a lot to do. With, first, the Sumer, Sumerian. The first letters that exist are contracts. <laughs> so it's basically like, that it has to be maybe not so much with um, that now is very different. It's just that now maybe there is just more movement across. The, or we're talking about the, the societies that are necessarily in cities where there's a lot of change of the groups, where in small geographies where it's still important to honor, the youth still holds a lot. And I find that in this case it's more an economy that the oath reveals. That is already existing. For instance, an oath is is usually um, pursued when there is already something going on that talks about that oath. Usually, something in the other way around, something that binds the person, and the person then responds. And there is an economy that comes out after that. For instance, if someone does an oath, I can say that I was uh, acting on something in good faith in relationship to that oath, and that sometimes is a um, in our contracts as well, is a figure that can have a juridic value even though there is nothing signed. It, it seems to me that it's part of a movement that is preceding the oath. No? That's uh, the, the reason why oath is linked to law. A contract, this is the oral contract, mm -hmm. is a kind of oath. Why it doesn't engage itself according to the word that you said? So, for instance, the merchants already in Sumer were considered not to have word, and therefore it had to be <laughs> it had to be always a document because there were people that belonged to several cities. So there's something about that. Yeah, it's also, it's also yeah. you said, economy, but more than that, it's really a kind of foundation of the law. Maybe you touched on this already. <coughs> What role the witness plays in the concept of the oath? Because we make all kinds of oaths, and a lot of them involve witnesses. So the oath isn't just a kind of binding of one person to another person. There's very often a third person involved. And I'm wondering if the witness is some kind of prototypical judge, someone who um, isn't directly involved in this transaction, but they, um, uh, they they still have a kind of interest in it, a kind of abstracted. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the, wit on the witness. As we, we said, in the old form of uh, oath, <coughs> the role of witness is played by the God. Mm -hmm. God is invoked as witness to what I'm studying. But then, as you said, 
then uh, a man can come as a witness. And, uh, and then uh, the same, because then the witness has to give an oath in some way to show that he's witnessing the thing the truth. So the figure of witness is uh, involved in what is uh, implied. <coughs> I don't think it's not uh, what grounds the book. I think it's uh, a kind of a complementary element. <coughs> it must be there, but it's not really the, the foundation of the book. I think. Uh, I just want to change the subject. I want to get back to thinking about um, the tools, the ontologies, and how this relates to the investigation in to the first hypothesis of the archaeological uh, historical machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking for these origins, looking for these bases, whatever. Are the ontologies how do they play a part? Is it the crossing? Is it the absence of one or the other? So the, 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 this model, the tautology is in reference to the uh, origin uh, commandment. Yeah, so down there I can. So I, I begin with this uh, link between uh, origin and commandment. Then trying to understand what a commandment is and trying to answer to the question, what does it mean when I say walk? Then I came to this second hypothesis, so which is not directly, uh, uh, does not come from the first one, but I think in some way it's linked, because it, um, uh, it's, a w it's a way to understand what a co how a commandment functions. Why does a commandment uh, works? <coughs> Which kind of reference to being it implies? No, that, that's uh, the, the idea what we are trying. We are going on. We are going on, of course. But we are trying to understand. So, so the link is just this. That, uh, yes? Just a, a quick grammatical question. So far, you said that these two um, locoi I'm wondering exactly to what extent the subjunctive mood is the third mood also plays a role in this, since, I mean, in English it's not so specific, but in other languages you do have kind of an imperative aspect of the subjunctive, except that it expresses a desire or a wish or something that is completely separated from reality. Well, the imperative can revert back to a concrete situation, even though it's referring to something that is yet to be in Yeah, yeah uh, the general point is that uh, grammar is relevant to philosophy. <laughs> that, uh, I mean, uh, grammatical questions are philosophical questions. And for the imperative and the indicative, it's clear. You correctly also brought the problem uh, subjunctive. Uh, right, as you said, um, uh, some often subjunctive is used as a form of imperative, fiat. Remember the, the very the very paradigm of uh, the creation uh, is expressed. Uh, fiat, fiat is a subjunctive. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the esto would have been the imperative. So, so what we have is that subjunctive uh, takes the, uh, is brought on the part, uh, on the side of the <coughs> imperative. Th then, uh, I mean, what, what would be the ontology of subjunctive? Uh, it's another <coughs> investigation. Also, because there is, uh, as you know, a declining of sub the usage of subjunctive in the language like Italian, French, who have a strong usage of the subjunctive. But then we see that uh, persons very often use the indicative instead of the subjunctive. So there is a kind of decline. It was not correct. Grammatically, they should employ the subjunctive and then uh, so it uh, would be an interesting we could uh, perhaps try to but, but uh, the important thing that often as you said the subjunctive works as an imperative fiat uh, 
This is also because the imperative is so defective. When the imperative is only, uh, this is mainly the second person, while fiat is a, third, it's a, a way of a say, stating an imperative in the third person. You cannot do an imperative. But it's interesting that it can be declined. In the subjunctive as a move, it can be declined into all the persons, into the first, second, and third. And it can also embed an imperative in an indicative construction. So you can say, like, I wish that he were to come. In a way, it's, I mean, English, once again, doesn't really capture the potential of having an imperative within the subjunctive construction of describing what's happening. Yeah, we could, um, you should try to make an ontology of the subjunctive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering to return to the oath, if maybe we could read it in the other direction, that in a way the oath sort of empties out a space for language that we aren't bound to. So I could say tomorrow we'll have lunch, but maybe we will have lunch, maybe we won't. But because there's this other space of the oath, then there's room for this language that we're not bound to. I swear that we will have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, the imperative is a pleasant obligation. <laughs> well, but, but by separating out this, this special language for swearing to something, we can then say things that we, we aren't sworn to, that we, we wouldn't. That first, a serious person will not uh, take a note for the lunch. <laughs> right, no, that's what, that's what I'm saying, is that, promise that, we, uh, that, that we then have this other language. What we learn, I don't know if we have still time. We'll try to do tomorrow. Then go back to this uh, problem because, of course, uh, swear, swearing is the paradigm of the speech <coughs> by excellence. <coughs> then we have to understand what does it happen when we pronounce a word. This is better. We we'll try to do tomorrow because it's a big question. They say, I swear that, I don't know, I'm, I'm in a trial, I, I'm accused uh, of having uh, killed a man uh, yesterday in uh, Sasfe, and they say, I swear that uh, yesterday I was not in Sasfe, I was in Vegas. But then, uh, pay attention to that, uh, go back to this tomorrow, I swear that Yesterday I was in Rome. So we try to analyze uh, this form because a, a swear is always uh, followed by what is called a dictum. You can say I swear alone only if someone else has said something, but otherwise you have to swear and then something must follow. I swear that. So we try to understand what happens when uh, these two elements are joined. <coughs> um, I wonder if we can answer obedience, because um, when you put this out into the world, this statement, this performative statement that you will or will not do such a thing, it almost becomes a criteria then for judgment, and so for punishment if you do otherwise. Then I get your question. An interesting point while you are while you're speaking. Why does oath oblige? Because we said uh, we used to think that uh, uh, religious men or in old times where people <coughs> really believed in religion, then they uh, felt obliged because they were religious, because they believe in God. So I invoked God, then I had to this is the implication. But it is, we saw this not really true because already in the Ashat <coughs> perjury was common and people today feel obliged by an oath. Also when you like in the form you said when a, 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 per, a, non, a not religious man so, you, you think, yes. so there is a oath which, which are taken by no religious man. And they feel obliged. And that's a very interesting point. When Mussolini established the fascist regime in Italy, he asked all university professors to take 
and note on fidelity to fascism. So to swear, fidelity to fascism. And interesting as far as the morality of university professor is implied, only 11 professors in Italy refused to take this oath. All the other uh, took this oath. Probably they were not fascists because this was in the beginning, so just they <laughs> took an oath. So, but for instance, one of the, the persons who take an oath was a, a professor of law who then became very famous also in the left uh, after the end of fascism. So, but very strangely, he said uh, the oath is really a vicious thing because then your conscience feels obliged to your oath. Meaning that uh, when he swore the fidelity to fascism, he felt some obligation to keep his oath. No? Because one can imagine he swore but then he ignored. No. So those the strange question that why does oath in some way oblige? I was just going to say that as um, <coughs> it's not the punishment, of course, because we are not punished for them. As, as a, another reading of basically what, what you're saying, there's um, many of you saying that the uh, commandment isn't the, the? Uh, the commandment is not a commandment. 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 So a command that is talking about thou shalt not kill that command. Uh, that it's not a criteria for judgment, but a guideline, so that maybe then we can look at an oath as acknowledging that this is a guideline that you'll live by, but still that this is something that the person or the community will have to grapple with in solitude. Yeah, yeah but when anyone was asking this question, why do we the we feel obliged it's a way to a note, even if we do not really believe, uh, or even if you are not convinced, like uh, this man was not convinced of taking this oath. Probably it has to do with the problem of commandment we are analyzing, that we are going to analyze better. Why a commandment <coughs> works? Like we said, uh, if I command something, of course, uh, you can disobey, etc. But the fact of receiving a command puts you in a new situation. For instance, puts simply in the situation either I obey or I disobey. Simply that. So even if I don't care, but as a person comes and gives me a commandment, I am in this new situation. I don't care, I will not obey, but you have to take a decision. So the strange uh, power of a uh, commandment, uh, that even if you are really not uh, obliged, you to, uh, not really involved in it, but you are in a new situation. It reminds me of theater. Why, <coughs> why will 12 people all get together and memorize a script, and then when it's time for the show, everybody does it? to the letter, you know, to the best of their ability. How does that work? How does that hold together? How, 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 what's the question? Uh, no question. I, well, I just wonder, why does theater work so well? Why is theater so uh, uh, lawful or, you know, works? It always works. Why? The strange thing that the nectar begins to not to pronounce the correct sense in some completely different. <laughs> Interesting. I was looking back at my notes and um, early on you said, well, why do people command or what is a command? And just recently you said, what's at stake in when we issue a commandment? And I was sort of, again, looking back at this, what you talked about as the archaeo historical machine and that idea of the polarity of maybe origin and commandment, and is it something getting close to a destabilization of that polarity between origin and commandment that has some, I don't have all the philosophical words, sorry, but uh, some kind of uh, deep uh, destabilizing of sense of origin or <coughs> being of humanity, whether that means to be becoming human or inter 
corrupt that kind of process that you <coughs> kind of cling to in a kind of chronological way? Yeah, it, in some way, uh, our goal is in some way to disentangle, to dis establish this uh, uh, polite disconnection. <coughs> what we are trying to do here in some ways precisely this first to understand how a commandment works why, why do people command why do people feel obliged to obey etc etc et 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 and what is a, in, in its very linguistic form a commandment but then also to if you go back to archaeology also to disactivate to make inoperative this uh, I, I think that the, the example you gave uh, regarding Mussolini where there's a level of political, overt political coercion involved in the setting of an oath, those are almost specific kinds with underlying elements and there's even contemporary examples like in Israel the foreign minister Avigdor Lieberman has you know, puts out into the public realm that uh, Palestinians uh, who have Israeli citizenship should have a loyalty oath. And it's not so much of it actually coming to be or that the oath actually happens, it's to cater to a specific political constituency where such a position would be popular. And so, and, and it's a notion of creating a split maybe amongst groups as well, but there's a, you know, certain politicians play to that fragmentation because either you're in favor of it, or what, what, what do you have to be afraid of if you don't take the oath, and what does it mean? Yeah, uh, this goes with uh, the political usage of oath, you know, as we saw, even it's still like there. No? And there is a, a loyalty oath also in the States. <coughs> when you, when you are become an American citizen, you are not an American citizen, you become, you want to become an American citizen, you become, I say, you have to take an oath. So it's strange, this dysfunctional of old. It's, but we have, must keep in mind that this is connected with commandment in some way. So taking a note is a, a way to command to oneself, or and <coughs> if you are obliged to be commanded to command yourself. Accepting a commandment, taking an oath, like if I say, yes, I will do something, <coughs> is that and sort of that affirmation of the commandment and oath that you're taking to the commander? Sometimes if you freely decide to do this, you are commanding in some way to yourself. But often you are commanded to command. Because if you are obliged to take an oath, you are meant to command yourself. It's a subtle. Uh, question. Is there a difference between ought and have? Ought and have. <coughs> and have. Ought and have. And have. Because in ought in the sense of being, or have to being, have to well, being. Because in, in Spanish, ought is debes, and have is tienes. And I, I believe there's like a distinction between the two. Ought is like something that there's like a choice implied. Like you could do it, but you don't have to do it. You know? As like when, um, when you have, like when you're commanded, you have to do this. You don't have a choice. Like, Tienes que hacerlo. Tienes que hacerlo. You have to do it. It's like it's, the command is very clear that if you don't do it, there's going to be consequences. <coughs> As where you, when they say like when you told you have you ought to do it, you tú deberías hacerlo. Of course, there's a command, but there's it, it's kind of like ambiguous. You don't really like have to do it. Is there's like a, like a, a choice that you, you if you don't, like, 
Is, is there a difference between the two, or, or do you do put them in the same space? I, I employ this term odd because in English it's not so clear like uh, in French, uh, Italian, or that, where there is a clear uh, way of express. Uh, sein sollen, that's in German, it's very clear. In, in English, uh, I, I don't know, perhaps, how, how would be the correct form to say you should do, you should ought to. You must, 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 must is more is strong as must. Yeah. Mass is more strong. Yeah, I think that in English it more sort of depends on, on it being a condition that you say, you know, you should. It's sort of more if you like should or you ought to do something. It's more like if you do that, that good things will happen. But if you have to do something, you must do something. If you don't do it, bad things will happen. It's sort of more about the consequences. In my mind, it's a little more about the consequences of doing or not doing the thing that you should, must, ought, have to do. I think it ties in again this idea of obligation versus the subjective, the possibility. But there's two things that on the one hand you're obliged to do something, you must, mm -hmm. you're obliged to do it. On the other hand, there's the possibility for something that's like a subjective. You just said in, in Spanish, deberías, which mm -hmm. I think is subjective the case if you don't have an English, but it makes up more sense in Spanish. Mm -hmm. and we, we can't say it pretty much, we don't have the possibility. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, what teachers of English are told is uh, to make the distinction between have to and must is, uh, and, and in this case, they do make a clear distinction. Um, to have to is to react to an external. Whereas when you say you must do something, you're reacting to an internal pressure. So that's the way yeah, it yeah. I think that these explications are founded after to explain uh, the existence of this. Yeah, just to conclude now, uh, just think to the really important role that this peculiar verbs, which are called modal verbs, like to can, must, should, have to, etc., have in, uh, not only in language, but uh, in, uh, in philosophy, in uh, everywhere. So, I mean, uh, if you try to understand, but what does I can mean? What does I must mean? This is really a big philosophical question. <coughs> and the answer is much more complicated, so you cannot um, explain <coughs> so easily. I, it means uh, that the consequence, no, no, it's more. What does I can mean? I cannot. It's very difficult to understand. We, we go back to this problem, because it's essential to philosophy. Philosophy is, uh, in some way, <coughs> a peculiar usage of modern verbs. You wanted to say the last word? Uh, no, never. But, um, perhaps one distinction, uh, and this is where the, the disparity in Spanish and English comes into English as you have to do something, or you should do something, or you ought to do something. And the distinction is to have to do something is to possess the obligation. The obligation is yours. It's to, and it also ties into what you were saying about a, a distinction between interior and exterior. You must do something operates more like a command. You have generally, to do something. Every generally. explication which refers to interiority and exteriority is false. Yes. <laughs> what does it mean that I have the interior? What does it mean that I have the interior? What is that? That would be here. <laughs> I absolutely agree that it's false, but in the, in, in the example of to feel in your conscience an obligation uh, to uh, the oath that you have made to fascism, for example, is very similar to what happens within the framework of metanoia, to, to feel that, that one has a confession, within the, the, the framework of confession, to feel that one has a certain disposition uh, and that that disposition can be discharged and that it, it will operate on 
to your conscience, but maybe similarly false. Yeah, but this position is not an interiority. It's a right. defense of the possibility, <coughs> potentiality. potentiality. Now, as far as this problem of interiority and intention, it's also very beautiful detail design example to show how the concept of uh, intention meaning is ridiculous. He says, um, this door is open. Now, say the same sentence, meaning it, really meaning it. <laughs> the door is open. <laughs> I really mean this. It's ridiculous, it means nothing. <laughs> okay, so we'll see.